Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rajat Saxena, uh, and I would like to welcome you all to the Project Nature Lecture Series. So today we are going to learn about one of the most fascinating organisms of this planet, lichens. And we have a leading expert on lichens, Dr. Robert Clips, here with us to teach us about lichens. Uh, Dr. Clips uh, joined the, he is uh, currently the emeritus, uh, Professor Emeritus in the Department of uh, Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology. He joined the OSU faculty in 1996. He retired in uh, 2017. And uh, he also has a wonderful website of his own, bobclips.com, so check that out. He posts beautiful pictures of lichens and moss and talks about very nicely, uh, educates uh, on his website there. Also, I have a lichen field guide. We've got three field guides from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Uh, you can grab a copy if you want the uh, online version of this guide. It's, uh, I have put that in this uh, month's newsletter. Also, all the pictures of the different species of lichens you see in here is by our esteemed speaker. And he is also acknowledged here in the field guide. Right here. So without any further delay, I will have Dr. Phipps uh, start with his talk. Okay, great. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And um, I mean, like everyone probably is familiar with lichens as being um, famous for being symbiotic uh, dual organisms consisting of fungi and algae. And Rajat wrote a really interesting article where he pointed out that the word symbiosis was actually developed for lichens. That was really cool. I didn't know that. And um, which is true. But really, lichens, you should think of them mostly as being fungi. And um, so in, in order to help us understand lichens, I'd like to share with you a little brief introductory course on the study of fungi, which is mycology. Oh. Rajat, come back. How do you, um, oh, do I, how does this work? Oh, I roll a little thing here, because usually there's an arrow works, but the arrow's not working. Oh, I know why, it's a numb one. No. Okay, so I use, so I'll just use this, so I'll just use this. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, just back up a tiny bit more. Um, people so sometimes associate mosses and lichens. Um, in fact, a club that I'm a member of is called the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association. They tend to grow in similar places, mosses and lichens do, but mosses are plants, lichens are fungi. They're very completely unrelated. In fact, we are more closely related to lichens than plants are. So I just want to make, make this clear that um, here on this boulder, we can see mosses and lichens. Um, um, the uh, green material is a moss, totally not a lichen, it's a plant. Um, and I just want to make that distinction. Um, there is a, a, a lichen in the center of this picture. It's uh, one of the ones that I'll share with you momentarily. And, and this is a picture of the moss. They grow in similar places. They have something in common in terms of their physiology, which is that they are quite low hydric. Uh, it means that whatever humidity or atmospheric, whatever moisture they have is pretty much what's in the environment. It's like the way cold-blooded animals are for temperature, these organisms are for moisture. They don't have tissues that transport water. So they have to be able to dry out, but not die. And, this, and they tend to grow in similar places, mosses and lichens do. But in terms of what kind of organisms they are, totally different. Um, uh, again, they tend to share similar substrates. Um, one of these people is looking at a lichen, and one of these people is looking at a moss. Which one is which? Um, I can tell because Ray, on the left is a lichenologist, Barb on the right is a bryologist. Um, and this is, a, this is Ray, Ray Shulman, who is uh, one of the, who's the actual um, accomplished principal lichenologist in Ohio. Thanks for that, I'm just an amateur. Uh, this is a book called Natural Lichens of Ohio, and I'm gonna share with you some of the techniques that they use to identify lichens in the most technical way. And this is a, a book, which is uh, fairly comprehensive, but it lacks um, photographs. This book is, very incomplete, but has photographs. Um, so what I'd like to share with you is the, the fungi. Um, here's a little tree of life that shows the relationships of uh, organisms. You'll notice up in the upper right hand corner that fungi and animals are fairly closely related. Uh, and so that's why when I said that you're more closely related to a lichen than a moss is, that's the basis of that uh, statement. 
So I want to tell you a smidge about, about fungi. Uh, and, and so this part has some photographs that aren't mine. Most of the presentation, they are. Um, so fungi are basically filamentous decomposers. They, 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 they have strands, or barely visible strands, that secrete material from their environment. Um, and um, the classification of fungi, pretty simple, compared with a lot of other kingdoms of living things, of which fungi, fungi is one. Um, so these are one, two, three, four, five, are the, are the major um, uh, phyla of, of fungi. And um, what I'd like to share with you is just a tiny little overview of mycology to tell you that um, one of the phylums of fungi is called ascomycetes. Mycete means fungi. Ascus is a structure within which spores are produced. And this type of fungus is the fungus that nearly all lichens belong to. So again, lichens are principally fungi. Some people like to say lichens are a symbiosis. They are. Some people like to say that lichens are a lifestyle. They are. I like to say that lichens are fungi that have discovered agriculture. They basically are mostly fungi and they have a garden of algae in their tissues. Um, the type, most lichens are what are called ascomycetes. This is a non-lichenized ascomycete. But if, if you have some familiarity with mycology, you might have recognized these brilliant cups um, that are the spore-producing structures. They're aggregates of the spore-producing structures. Microscopically, there's more, there's more to it. Um, this is a, a, microscope, a electron microscope view of the structure within which the spores are produced. And it's basically, it's called an ascus. It's basically, it's, it's a sac. So sometimes these are called sac fungi. I think of it as being like a sock with eggs in it, it's in, in terms of a model. The eggs are spores. They're not eggs, they're spores. Um, and um, typically there's eight of them, not always. Um, so here's a diagram that shows a cross section of one of those cups. And one of those swollen hyphae produces single cells that can produce new organisms. Those are spores. Um, so the way in which the spores are produced in fungi, and we'll see this, these two types in lichens, are often they're aggregated into cups that are called an apothecium, apothecium, I'm not sure. Sometimes they're just shaped differently. They're little flasks with a little opening at the top. And that's called a parathecium. And they're basically they're lined with those um, swollen hyphae that produce spores inside. And that's how fungi reproduce. So this is a picture of a, of a lichen, a crust, one of the crust-forming lichens that has what are called parathecia. They're flask-shaped ascocarps that um, you only see the opening as little dots on the top. And this, this view from a microscope shows the eight spores. So this, this is an ascus with eight spores in it. Typically, typically there's eight, which is kind of weird, but um, um, many fungi reproduce asexually, some type of fragmentation. And so um, uh, the fungi that you think of as yeasts, by the way, are unicellular. Uni, uh, a yeast is just a general name for a unicellular fungus that doesn't have strands as its major body form. Um, it's not so pertinent to lichens. Um, so this is another picture of an ascomycete showing this cup that produces spores. And this is a cross section through a microscope uh, that shows those sacs that contain the spores that are called acci. So that's the type of fungus that most, almost all lichens are. Oh, by the way, just to give you, to complete our miniature course on mycology, um, the more familiar fungi are probably um, the basidiomycetes. These are the ones that are mushrooms, toadstools, um, uh, earth stars, stinkhorns. Um, so these, these basically, same basic idea. Structurally, they're strands of hyphae packed together. Um, what they do is they produce their spores by blending off to the tips of hyphae. Um, they look like little clubs. Sometimes these are called club fungi, the way that the ascomycetes are called sac fungi. And um, so these are some textbook pictures showing how spores are produced. And the other major group of fungi, which is called the So um, lichens. Here's a little a limerick about lichens. The lichen, there, there's this woodcut uh, book called How to Tell the Birds from the Flowers. And it's this artist that drew whimsically 
resembling flowers and birds and also had this one about lichens and lichens regardless of conventions exist in only two dimensions a life restricted to a plane on rocks and stones a greener stain they live upon the simplest fare a drop of dew a breath of air contrast them with the greedy hen and her most careless regimen she shuns the barren stones and rocks and thrives upon the garbage box um, this little picture of a sketch of a lichen this lichen here that I, it looks so much like the sketch. I want to assure you that it's just naturally how it occurred. It's not photoshopped. I would never photoshop a lichen. That's just something that would be it, it, improper to photoshop a picture of a lichen. Um, so this is a picture of a branch of a tree, a redwood tree, with um, uh, lichens growing on it and flowers coming out of it. This is totally not photoshopped. I would never photoshop a lichen. This is just a redbug tree that produces flowers on the branches. And this particular lichen, notice please, it has these those cups um, that are, uh, that microscopically contain the, the sacs called acai. And so this is the spore producing structure of, of a Ascomycete fungus that happens to be lichenized. Um, so uh, I'd like to share with you a short little video that was um, produced by Science Friday people, and Rajat's gonna make it work because
questions about anything so far? They had bacteria. Yeah, I think it's kind of overrated. I don't know if there's a lot of discourse about that, at least not as far as identification is concerned. Um, and there's also a lot of interest a couple of years ago was discovered that there's a second fungus that is a yeast, meaning a unicellular fungus that lives in the outer layer of many lichens. And it was unnoticed because it was small and uh, it's also something about the genetics of it that caused it not to show up when they did the DNA studies. And hooray, you know, there's maybe two fungi. Yeah. So um, as James told us, um, there are uh, growth forms of lichens, and they're sort of they're sort of rough, approximate growth forms. Fo uh, folios, leafy ones, that is to say, fruticose, shrubby ones, that is to say, and crustose, crusty ones, that is to say. There's a little inter uh, gradation uh, and different types, a few different types, but. Let's focus our attention on the morphology of a, a typical uh, foliose lichen. And a foliose lichen, um, foliose lichens basically have um, a body that simulates a leaf. So not only do they look leafy, but they kind of um, are, are structured the way leaves are. And, and in the interest of, uh, of um, clarity, I'd like to um, share with you um, a model of a lichen. So here's the official um, lichen model of science, which um, consists of this piece of bread and this, uh, this ramen and, and um, these uh, peanuts here. And hold on one second, I need to... Uh, and then the second piece of bread, and this is a uh, this is peanut butter cup. So what I like, what I have just constructed, of course. is a model of a folio lichen. Uh, what do the pieces of bread represent? Indeed, kind of uh, the high if you're packed really closely together forming like a covering or, 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 or a little skin. What do the ramen noodles represent? What do the ramen noodles represent? It's called the medulla. It's sort of puffy, fibrous, sort of soft, um, uh, airy uh, part of the, the lichen. And the toothpicks, arise lines, which are attachment structures, which may or may not be present. And finally, um, the uh, the Reese's peanut butter cup is. Oh, it's not showing here, but you think what well, uh, we use the word cup before? It is a an apothecium, a, a spore producing structure of a lichen. And um, uh, that is, uh, and so all of these features. Oh, and the peanuts. I forgot to mention the peanuts. Of course, are the algae layer. And typically in a, a, a foliose lichen, and in most lichens, you have this stratification. And the algae layer um, forms a layer that is um, just below the upper cortex where the sunlight can reach it. And it's basically kind of like a leaf. Um, and that is uh, uh, the structure of a foliose lichen. Now most of these things, I'm interested keenly in observing things and seeing the biological diversity. So many of the things that, we're, that I'm telling you about are interesting in and of themselves but also there are things that vary from one lichen to another uh, and help you to, to identify certain lichens, of which there are about, uh, very rough, about 400 to 500 in Ohio. Mo um, and uh, with those three cl classifications of folios, fruticose, and crustose, about half of them are crustose. Crustose lichens are a little bit challenging to identify, uh, and a lot of people don't even try. Um, and the other two, the folios and the fruticose, are the ones that most naturalists will, will, will attempt to, to identify. Um, so um, here's a picture of a lichen growing on a tree. Um, and um, here's a close-up of this lichen. 
And see what I did there? Remember I made the joke about I've never photoshopped a lichen? See? Yes. Um, and um, if you take, make a cross section of this lichen, you'll see that same stratification. So here's the, here is the algae layer. Um, and it's just below the upper cortex, and it's like a layer of, uh, of, of algae. The hyphae uh, get really, really close to it and absorb nutrients that the algae produce. Algae are, algae are like plants. They're not plants. Um, they do photosynthesis the way plants do and um, produce food for the, for the, for the part mentioned. So this is a cross-section of a foliose lichen. This is the undersurface showing the attachment structures, the toothpicks, that is to say the rhizines. And you'll notice that lower cortex is white. Um, some lichens, the lower cortex is not white. It's a different color, black perhaps, a yellow perhaps. Sometimes there aren't rhizines. Sometimes there are branched rhizines. So here's a, so, so what I want to share with you is pictures of lichens showing some of the features that can help you differentiate different lichens. So this, for example, is a lichen called, called um, uh, Phaeophysia rubropulchra that has an, a very, very colorful medulla. Also, the cortex is brown, um, but a, a few lichens have brown uh, uh, color. But if you scrape away the, the cortex and look at the medulla, it's orange. It's called the orange cord shadow lichen. Now, um, the way that lichens reproduce. Lichens, as you know, uh, now, are a partnership. And the, uh, the spores that I referred to when we described uh, that they're ascomycetes, those are fungal spores. And the, the fungus by itself can't, uh, isn't a lichen and might not be able to persist, well, isn't able to persist. Um, so it's, to me, it's surprising at all that lichens produce apothecia and spores. Um, because what those spores have to do is to grow enough to find an alga that happens to be living by itself, that's the kind of alga that can form a partnership. And apparently it works because if for some, it was thought for a while that maybe that the apothecia were just vestiges of uh, evolutionary past that had, that, were, um, that had no function anymore. But that apparently is not the case because they, many lichens that produce their spores do not reproduce any other way. What other ways could they? Well, the ways that they could, which are shown on the right and the middle, um, are asexually. And basically, by a type of fragmentation. So these are special fragmentation structures that lichens produced. Um, there are two general types. Um, I think it was, uh, they're called serratia and isidia. And I think of um, uh, serratia as being like um, spaghetti and meatballs. Imagine if you grabbed into a pot of spaghetti and meatballs. The spaghetti is the mycelium. The meatballs are the um, the algae, and just like you know, threw it against the wall. And if that could make all new spaghetti and meatball dinner then that's how lichens reproduce asexually. In lichen language, not ridiculous metaphor language, they are um, powdery, they're dusty. So, so, so many lichens will reproduce by the production of this powdery uh, sloughing off, and those are called seredia, and that's nice. Some lichens, they're basically the same idea, asexual fragmentation, including both the fungus and the algae, but they're finger-like projections that snap off. They're tiny, tiny. Um, they're called isidia. And so they look like little projections. Now, the, the J James Landemer um, didn't, he, he opens his video by saying, ah, oh, I forgot my hand lens. Um, this hand lens, which is what um, um, people who are studying mosses and lichens now, um, it's equivalent to what bird watchers have binoculars for. Is, is what people use to examine things in the field. It magnifies things about 10x, um, and it's sort of indispensable for, for um, uh, field mycology and bryology. So, um, so here's, here's some um, apothecia of a, of a very common lichen called Phisia, called, uh, called um, star, uh, star rosette lichen, Phisia stellaris. Um, so if you were to, like I did, um, take a cross section with a razor blade and put it in a microscope slide and press really hard and look at, 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 at under the microscope at 400 power, you would see these, these massi. They're small and hyphae with spores in them. And that's what lines the apothecia. And this lichen only produces by, by spores, which is kind of unusual. And it helps you identify it. 
Here's another type, another ascus through a microscope. This one only has four, uh, two spores, and um, they're really big. And that's really unusual, uh, that they have two spores. Generally, they have eight. It's sort of the standard number, which is kind of weird. If you're, if you, if you're interested in uh, sexual life cycles, the products of meiosis are typically four haploid nuclei, which is what you saw on the club fungus, Pisidia. Um, but ascomycetes, they typically undergo mitosis after they do meiosis to take two times four, Matthew and I can do, to make eight, as, eight, eight ascospores. Um, and that's a typical number. So here's a picture of the asexual reproductive structures. Um, the, the resolution of the uh, projector isn't probably good enough to show you, but um, please believe me, the one on the top has those finger-like projections called isidia, and the one on the bottom, the pottery, uh, sloughing off called Soredia. And this lichen, these lichens, mo many lichens, I guess most lichens, reproduce either exclusively asexually by means of these sorts of things or predominantly asexually by means of these sorts of things. That is to say, asexual propagules. Um, this is a lichen that's uh, called um, uh, rock stickleback, st stipple, stipple, stippleback, I think. Um, and it has little dots on the upper cortex. Those are the openings of those flask-shaped parathesia that, um, so it produces, it produces spores. It doesn't, it, has, it doesn't have a nice peanut butter cup, but it's, it's in there someplace. Um, this is uh, um, uh, a feature of, the, of lichens that will help you identify certain ones. Um, some lichens have little speckles on the outer surface. They happen to be called pseudocyphalae, what they are are breaks in the upper cortex, and you can sort of see the medulla shining through, uh, showing through it. And it's sort of a speckled, uh, a speckled appearance. One of these, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to start this one over again uh, with the hand lens. Here's how to use the hand lens. The way to use the hand lens is to hold it uh, not like this, but if you wear glasses, you know what this means. And hold it right up your eye and then look really closely. And the way the center of this light can do it's bumpy. Uh, it's, um, I see, of uh, this, um, of this, oh, I'm sorry, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, do notice the Isidia and also notice that the margins of this lichen, notice please the pseudocyphalae. Um, so those little speckles. This is sometimes called rough speckled shield lichen. Uh, the rough part is the Isidia, the speckles are the pseudocyphalae. It's a big important genus, really easy to recognize in the field. And now you know. Um, the colors of lichens. The video, they cut, said they come in, in red. Ooh, they come in yellow. Ah, look, there's a Katie did. Not a lichen. Um, I forgot my hand lens. Um, the colors of lichens are interesting in and of themselves because they're pretty. Also, they help you to identify them. Lichens produce a lot of uh, uh, unusual chemical compounds that only lichens produce. Some, they're probably to protect from ultraviolet and also to, to deter herbivory. And um, certain particular hues uh, are useful in classification. So the pigmentation of lichens is nice to, uh, it has, has a sort of a technical basis. And one of, the, one of the colors of lichens, it takes a little while to sort of get a feel for it, it's a yellowish green color. It's not like a brilliant yellow or a brilliant orange. I'll show you some of them. Um, but this, this yellowish green color, it's caused by this chemical called usnic acid. And it helps you identify a certain group of like, well, uh, 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 when I say group, not particularly closely related, but um, uh, uh, artificial categories of lichens by this yellow green color. So this, so this lichen right here um, is has this yellow green color that stands out, that helps you recognize it. It happens to be called Flavo punctilia. A lot of the genus names with Flavo in it, that means yellow, I think, um, are due to usnic acid and have that peculiar color. So here, here's, here's, an, here, here's a close up of that, of uh, Flavo punctilia. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, it produces serratia, powdery asexual structures, and these aggregates. 
these lip-shaped aggregates that are called serralia. Um, so that color, that aggregation of the serralia, uh, is the steps in the identification of this particular lichen. So um, in the guide, um, um, if you turn in this in the lighting guide um, to page twelve, um, you'll see several illustration-sized spaces where the picture should go. Well, they wouldn't go. I had my collaborators in this project actually had the courtesy to read the email that I sent them saying, here are some diagrams of lichens that I paid someone to draw for our guide. But they didn't. And so this is what I wish this page looked like. There. Um, I never miss a chance to, 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 to diss my colleagues on this project. Um, three major categories of lichens that James Lennon will already talk about. Um, the more permanent um, homos and fruticos, the ones that most people will identify um, in fact, this book um, on Ohio lichens is called the Macro Lichens of Ohio. Um, they're big. Macro means big. So the folios ones and the fruticose ones, um, they're, 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 fairly, they're comparatively easy to identify. And there's nice literature for them. And most naturalists will uh, be content identifying the macro lichens. The crustos lichens, sometimes called micro lichens, there's more of them and the other two put together, they're just lichens, but people tend to be afraid of using technical manuals or compound microscopes, and so they often get ignored, um, which I think is a shame. Here's a, here's a, here's a rock with a, a smoky-eyed boulder on it. It's a crustose lichen, and it's got some lovely apothecia right in the center, um, and that's um, a, a, a crustose lichen. Um, so here's some pictures of the same thing. So let me just show you some of the variety of, uh, of these lichens and these different growth forms. Um, so here's two folios lichens. Um, these two folios lichens are two species of punctilia, the ones with those speckles, the pseudocyphalae. And um, this is an example of a fruticose lichen. There's a lot of variability in fruticose lichens. Here's one that's branched. Um, it's sometimes called beard lichen because it kind of looks like a beard. Um, and it's an example of a fruticose lichen. Here is that, that boulder that I shared with you before showing you the moss to let you know that mosses and lichens are different. Um, and this is the, uh, the smoky-eyed boulder lichen, uh, Porpidia albocellulescens, which is growing on the boulder also. That's the one that the sample is of. Uh, mo most crustose lichens will produce spores because being so tightly adhered to the substrate, they don't have elaborate structures that can slough off, like Isidia or Serenia, although some do. Uh, and, but typically, you'll see epithesia, and you'll look at the spores and see features of them. Epithesia, boom. Um, so here's uh, another type of, of fruticose lichen. Um, one of the types of fruticose lichens is this, uh, are these um, reindeer lichens? Um, they're very, very branch. The branches are called Cordicia. And uh, these are, uh, I wrote a few in another genus called Cordonia. Um, Cordonia is a, 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 a prominent genus of fruticose lichens. And some of them uh, uh, don't have anything else to their bodies except these tubular, tubular. Uh, strands that branch and end in tips. Um, sometimes they produce apothecia, sometimes they just fragment. This is another form, growth form of fruticose lichens. It's called cladiniform, cladoniaform. Um, it's the typical growth form of, of the genus cladonia, even though that earlier one is also. And what it does is it produces uh, basically scale-like or more or less folios-like what's called a primary phallus, P-H-A-L-L-U-S. The word phallus is a word that means sort of an undifferentiated body, um, something that isn't leafy, that just has lobes. Uh, well, you'll call its body the phallus. It's a simple body form. So the, the, the body of a fungus is often called a phallus. Um, this is called the primary phallus. And then springing up from it, is, uh, are these stalks that happen to be called fadicia. 
And this is the growth form. Scaly primary thallus, upright radicia. That's, that's a typical way that a lot of Cladonia lichens grow. Um, here's a, here's a well-known, uh, uh, it's called British Soldiers, uh, Cladonia cristatella. It's a typical Cladona form, Cladonia form, however you say that, fruticos lichen. Um, here's another fruticose lichen. It's, it's branched an awful lot, called Ivernia mesomorpha. So here's a typical folios lichen. This one has that yellowish green color. The, I call it the flavo look, because a lot of the genera that have flavo in their name are in reference to that, osnic acid. So this yellow green color. You learn to recognize it as distinct from a steel gray color, and it helps you identify. This is called um, common green shield lichen. Flavo parmelia caparata. And it, it has broad lobes, it produces ceridium, and it's um, fairly common on trees. It's one of the first lichens you'll learn. One of the nice things about studying lichens is that lichens are very sensitive to air pollution. And our air quality has improved markedly and substantially since the Clean Air Act of the 70s. And many lichens were completely eliminated from large parts of, well, everywhere, but Ohio in particular. Uh, my friend and colleague, Ray Shulman, who wrote this book, worked for American Electric Power and also wrote the book that you have now. Um, and his job was to monitor air quality using lichens. And this lichen was practically exterminated from Ohio. Now it's come back and it's very common. Um, and a lot of the lichens for which there are only historical records are now um, reappearing. So it, but lot, environmental stuff is mostly, is often seems to be all bad news. Um, studying lichens is really kind of encouraging because we get to see things appearing, reappearing after being gone for a long time. So, hooray. Flavo parmelia caparata is one of those. Um, so here's a, here's a one that's got a lovely color. This is a more brilliant color. It's orange. Um, and it's a, a folios lichen called Xantho Mendoza. I brought a little piece of, a little piece of wood that's got the Xantho Mendoza on it. Um, Santo Mendoza. Um, so here's one that, so, so what, what, what we're seeing now is some of the ways in which life differs from each other. Um, here's one that produces um, acai, uh, apothecia only, doesn't reproduce asexually. Okay, so I'd like to share with you some lichens that are kind of off the beaten path as far as their growth form is concerned. Um, we've learned about folios, fruticose, and crustose. Um, again, those are kind of categories like shrubs, trees, and vines. You know, they're sort of general growth form categories, and there are things that don't quite fit those categories. Um, so here's one. This one seemed to can't, can't seem to make up its mind if it's crustose or fruticose. It's called pink earth lichen, a uh, dibaeus deomyces, and it grows on the ground on bare clay soil in open areas, and it looks like a sort of whitish plus you might not even recognize as being a lichen. You might just think it's, it's a, a, a chalky sort of soil. And sometimes that's all it grows. And then you're kind of really stuck for identifying it unless you're familiar with that. But then it produces these podesia that look like little pink lollipops with, with acai, excuse me, um, apothecia at the top. So that's kind of an odd one. It's sort of like half crustose, half fruticose. Ah. Um, Yeah, right. Um, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke before when I said that lichens are symbiosis with algae and fungi. Um, lichens are symbiosis between some type of photosynthesizing organism, such as, and usually, but not always, an alga. Algae are eukaryotic uh, um, organisms that do photosynthesis. And um, they, they are the most common type of photobiont, you know, the partner that does the photosynthesis. But some lichens, they have a different type of photobiont. They have a blue-green bacteria, which are prokaryotes, they're bacteria. They used to be called blue-green blue -green algae. They still sometimes are, but a lot of quotes are on the algae part because blue-green algae are bacteria, they're prokaryotes, not algae. Um, so this lichen is a, a type of so-called jelly lichen, it um, happens to have a, a cyanobacterial photobiont. And that's, um, 
uh, a, a cool, cool, a nice variety of lichen. This is another one. Now, this going back to this jelly lichen, they kind of look different. They sort of look gelatinous. They kind of have an odd form to them. If you look at their structure internally, they don't quite the ramen sandwich that this one is. Um, they're, they're, they're a little more amorphous inside. It turns out there's an, another genus of lichens called Peltigera, sometimes called pelts, that looks more normal in terms of folios lichens. They're broad, they grow in the ground, but lo and behold, they have a cyanobacterial photobiont. And the keys ask you to tell that. I don't know how you would tell it, but um, um, Peltigera, that's cool. They're, they're, their partner is not an algae, it's a bacterium. Um, this is an unusual growth form of lichen. I guess it's like folios, but it's, uh, it's, but it's, it's broad and it's attached at the center. It's called umbilicate, like umbilicus, like belly button, like a little singular attachment, like an umbrella. Um, and um, this, is, this one called rock tripe is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a lichen with an umbilicate uh, growth form. Here's a little lens. This is um, uh, along the... Um, um, Playa River over on Riverside Drive, the, the aptly named Riverside Drive um, by Fissinger Road. And um, there's this limestone. And on the limestone, there's this lichen growing. It's a, another umbilicate lichen. It's got parathesis. It's got these little dots on the outside. And it's uh, very abundant at this particular spot along Griggs Reservoir. Um, here's a little limestone bluff in Marion County. And I saw... Um, this growing on it. Um, I sent a letter to, a, I sent it to a friend of mine. He said, hi, Bob, the lichen specimen arrived today and I had a chance to look at it. I may never speak to you again. This is still as confusing as it was from the photograph. I can't help but think there are two species represented here. And he went on and on and on. He passed away a few years ago and I, I, I'm so sad because he was such a wonderful person. He was um, a stone deaf, but you, I still have better conversations with him about lichens than most people who have, who are, perfectly able hearing. He had this dial-up internet that's like slow as anything. I'd send him a request and he'd write back with about an hour and apologize for not writing back sooner. And it would be some detailed thing uh, uh, explaining all the pertinent aspects of it. Um, Don Flanagan is the co-author with Ray Shulman of the Macro Lichens of Ohio. Um, and he helped me identify this. And it turned out to be uh, a lichen with a swanulose growth form. Not quite crustose, not quite folios, but sort of like little flattened, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a word that besides squamules, little flakes, little flakes that are attached to the substrate. And it's a kind of an unusual species, and it's called earth stipple scale. And this is one of the distribution maps for Ohio, where the squares represent uh, early records, I can't remember the cutoff point, maybe 1965, and the circles represent more modern ones. And so, um, and that's what our group, the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association, does. We go to different counties and we uh, collect mosses and lichens and we have a project to atlas the distributions of the mosses and lichens and print maps like this and uh, advance science. Um, there's other growth forms of lichens. This is a cool one. Ooh, ooh. This is called the dwarf fruticos lichen. Very dwarf. It's basically... Um, a filamentous cyanobacterium with a little covering of fungus around it. And it's, it, sometimes it's, it's called, its common name is aptly, rock hair, Racodium rupestri. And it looks, this is the kind of thing that you, if you went to the uh, Hocking Hills, right near Conkles Hollow on Big Pine Road, walk back a little bit, it's a big rock house there with a the waterfall dripping down. Um, and you would see this and not maybe give it a second notice, but it's, uh, it's a lichen called, uh, uh, called um, rock hair, and it's, uh, it's called a dwarf fruticose lichen. So through the microscope, basically what you see are strands, but there's a little fuzziness on the outside of the strands. And that's, um, that's an unusual growth form. Ooh, ooh. Um, stubble lichens. So um, James showed us a lichen, well, uh, that, uh, that, that Phaeocalycium poly or already, whatever it was. Um, these are called stubble lichens. They look like little hairs sticking up. They're very small, um, and at the top is a, is a mass of spores that's produced, um, like powdering off it, and it's called uh, a stubble lichen. Here's a, here's a, a different view 
of this stubble lichen, typically growing on bare wood, uh, looking like, uh, like um, uh, it needs a shade. Um, this is one of my, this is a, 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 a dust lichen. Um, so remember, I described to you the soridia that are a way in which folios lichens can, and sometimes uh, others, can reproduce by sloughing off fungi and algae. Well, these lichens that are called dust lichens are all just serratia. There's no thallus, there's no filamentous part. It's they're just dusty serratia. And the, gen the, the genus is called Lepraria. Um, there's a number of species that are really hard to identify. Um, James Lendemer specializes in this. He did his dissertation work on it and has done a lot of, uh, to advance our understanding of the dust lichens. And this particular one is called Lepraria thinkii. And um, maybe you've seen this, it's growing on rocks in damp, shady environments. And it's just dust. You might think it's some sort of a, I don't know, dryer lint or something. Ooh, ooh. Uh, this is, these are called script lichens. They're a type of crustose lichen where the apothecia are embedded into the substrate. The substrate is a tree. And they, they're so irregular looking that they resemble writing. Um, and they're a type of crustose lichen where instead of producing cup-like, peanut butter cup-like epithecia, this is what they do. And they're called script lichens. This is one that's, um, it looks like a, like a parathecial lichen. In other words, a crustose lichen, it's got parathecia instead of apothecia. Sometimes they're called pyreno lichens. But this one is actually isn't lichenized. You look at, collect it, bring it home, look at it, and there's not any algae anywhere. It's like, why am I even showing it to you? Well, um, it's sort of traditional, I guess, that some non-lichenized fungi that are members of groups that include ones that are lichenized, the lichenologists will sort of have adopted them. So you might see this Julello fallaciosa in a list of the lichens of someplace, even though technically it's not. And that's, that's a kind of an unusual category of lichen, a lichen that isn't lichen. Ooh. Um, these guys, these guys called wart lichens, they're, they're crustose lichens whose epithecia are buried in little volcano-like pits. So it looks really bumpy. It's called wart lichen. And um, if you take one of these home and, well, lab, I guess, um, and cross-section and look at it under magnification, um, you see some details of the spores and um, you can identify it. Some of the places lichens grow. Um, lichens typically grow uh, where James told us, on rocks and on trees. Most of them grow uh, on the ground or on rocks and on trees. Places that are so adverse enough that they can't get outcompeted by plants. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share with you some of the unusual substrates for lichens. That might be all that I share with you. Uh, I'll give him the, the clock. Um, this is a canoe in my backyard. and. Um, Yes, my wife and I used to go canoeing in the North Woods, and we brought this canoe home and haven't used it in the last 30 years. And I was upset that it's getting 40 years, upset that it's getting all dirty. And I, and I looked very carefully at all the dirt on the canoe. It turns out that the dirt on the canoe is, is a veritable garden of lichens, uh, folios lichens mostly. Um, here's a gray one called, um, called um, Fissia milligrana. Here's a nice little brown one called Hypothesia um, syncola. There's a very colorful one called uh, lemon lichen, Candelaria con color. Yeah, so my dirty canoe is not uh, actually dirty. Um, this is, this, uh, this is uh, at a nature preserve, where I, a wildlife area where I was week before last. And this is metal, a metal pipe. And I, yeah, it looks like a tree, but it's not. Um, so here it is growing on metal. It's not super unusual, but I think it's kind of neat. Um, I went to Dawes Arboretum last weekend. And on this sign, um, it's uh, got a bunch of lichens growing on it. Here's a, I think a close up. Here's a close up. So here's this that flavor color, that osmic acid that shows the flavor parmelia. If you look, um, uh, this lichen here, um, it's called hammered shield lichen. It's got these dents in it. Looks like it's been struck with a little ball peen hammer. And um, there's a, so there's four or five different folios lichens on this. Um, I took a workshop in Crustose Lichens in Maine. We went to the seashore and on this piece of fiberglass, it's maybe the remnants of a shipwreck or something, 
um, is this, uh, this beautiful um, uh, lecanora. It's a crustose lichen that usually grows on wood. Um, uh, so this particular lichen, uh, this is a very widely distributed lichen. It's a, it's a really orange, yellow orange lichen called um, golden sunburst lichen, Xanthoria cariatina. And a few years ago, um, I got a, a message from my friend Rich Bradley, who lives in Delaware, um, Ohio, Delaware, and outside the art museum, he saw this beautiful lichen growing on this tree. And um, the tree was newly planted. So the tree came from a nursery, and there is some place other than central Ohio, um, maybe the Pacific Northwest or maybe Ontario, where the lichen is common. So this, this phenomenon of hitchhiking lichens, um, I've seen numerous instances, lichen, people who are interested in lichens see numerous instances of lichens that are um, attached to trees that are really kind of like not a common Ohio lichen or even an Ohio lichen at all, that are on newly planted uh, landscaping trees. So hitchhiking lichens, um, that's, that's, a, that's a thing. Um, so, so I will end with like a, uh, one more, just a little more variety of lichens. So imagine you're using this book to identify a lichen. Um, there would be a dichotomous key that asks you questions. And um, say you had this Flavo Parmelia caparata. Uh, one of the questions would say, is it folios? And you go, yeah. But what about the color? Um, is it um, gray, green, or yellow green? Um, it's not this yellow color. Um, or this orange color. Um, and then you would ask, what's the photobiont like? Is it um, a blue-green bacteria like in this jelly lichen? And you go, no, 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 it's not. Um, and then you would say, um, um, does it have rhizomes on the undersurface of it? And you'd find out that it does. This is an example of one that doesn't. Um, then you would find, ask, be asked whether it has those little dots on the upper surface. Does it have parathesia? Um, if it did, it might be something like this, but it doesn't. Um, and then um, you'd be asked if it's umbilicate attached to the center, like this, but it's not. Um, then you would be asked about the color. And um, the, um, uh, of the medulla, is it one of these brilliantly colored ones, like this? And you'd take a little cross section, you'd find out, no, it's not. Um, then you'd be asked if the lobes look like little cat's paws. Um, um, maybe like this one uh, that grows on cemeteries, this hooded rosette like it. And you'd decide, no, it's not like that. Um, and then you'd be asked a, a chemical test. It turns out there are some simple chemical tests. Potassium hydroxide, some weird organic chemical called phenylene diamine. Um, so this chemical, uh, placed upon the medulla turns red. Um, this chemical, KOH, placed upon the cortex of these two lichens, one's yellow, one's purple. Sometimes those chemicals have no reaction at all. This is one of the ways we identify, identify lichens, with chemical tests. Um, then we'd be asked if the lobes are broad or narrow, uh, and if the undersurface had a cortex. If it didn't, it might be like this. And then we'd be asked if it's got these little tiny pseudocyphalas that we learned about before. If it did, it might look like this, but it doesn't. Um, finally, we're asked about that flavo color, that usnic acid coloration, which um, if it uh, didn't have, it might look like the one on the right. Um, and finally, we would be uh, pleased to find out that it's uh, uh, flavo parmelia caparata. And those are the types of features that vary in lichens. Thank you for your attention. Class dismissed. Are very small and can blow through the air. And the spores are even smaller and can blow through the air. So they're, they're agents of dissemination. 
Yeah, and generally it's not. If you reproduce two different ways, the spores are more long distance, and the asexual ones are for spreading on a given area. Yeah. Yeah. How else can I help you? What's that? Uh, no. Um, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, that little, uh, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think there are. And there, that's, I'm, I, I find that striking and surprising. Same thing with mosses. There are very few. In case. Uh, some cosmopolitan, some fairly restricted. Uh, my impression is they're a little more restricted than you would expect. So that if you see a book of lichens of North America, say, you'll see these Ozark ones, these Midwestern ones, these New England ones that are different from what you have here. So they have a, they're, pretty, they're pretty regional. They're a lot more restricted in the distribution than you'd expect. Um, and some of that might be the opinions of the people making the decisions of what species are. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yes. You, uh, Climate change, the rising temperature, an issue, especially for, say, some of the mountainous regions and the lichens there, or are they fairly adaptable to that? Uh, I believe it is, but I just, just based on that you're hearing that it is for everything else, and I don't think they would be different in that respect. Yeah, and that there, it's possible there are some lichens that it seems to me, I'm new at this, but I look at the range maps there, and there are a couple of species that I seem to be more common that are southern. Now, I'm, this is not very scientific, but we see this, uh, this little lichen that, uh, called Pixine subsinaria, and I've seen it around here. And uh, the book's short as being more southern. And there's a few others I can't think of right away. So that most might be examples of it, but it should be, should be approached more scientifically. So I'd say range expansion.